I have had some times in my life where I was overwhelmed. That means arriving at that point in time where you just don't know what to do, whether you don't seem to find any answers, and where you don't know what's going to fix everything, and you kind of throw your hands up in the air and you're stupefied. That's kind of the spot we are in the book of the Revelation as far as John goes. I don't know if you've ever been there. This is the third message in the series of the book of the Revelation. I don't know how many it's going to take. And so if you'll follow along with me, I will read from chapter 1, starting with verse 17. And as I said last week, there's an A, B, and C to a verse if you split it into pieces. 17a. John speaking, When I saw the Lord, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. I haven't actually fallen down. I've been with people who fell down. I've been with people at funerals who couldn't stand, who fell at the casket. They were overwhelmed. They, they just couldn't make it, and they had to have someone help them. John here sees Jesus. He falls down like he's a dead man. But Jesus reaches out, and he lays his hand upon him and says, Don't be afraid. Acts 10, 25. Similar thing happened. Peter was coming to Cornelius, and he met him. Cornelius met him and fell down at Peter's feet and worshipped him. And Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am a man. None of us deserve to be worshipped. None of us deserve to be praised. I, uh, I still do have people sometimes at the end of a message say what a great job I did. And if I go visit somewhere and there are a lot of people, that happens often. And I arrived at the point in time where now I just say thank you. I used to say, it's not me that's doing this, it's the Lord that's doing this. And if they don't know that yet, I I'm sorry. But it's just not worth explaining to every person who walks up and says a good job. God deserves worship. The Lord deserves praise. I don't deserve praise for anything, and neither does any other man. It's a different answer than what Jesus gave. Jesus said, fear not. Peter said, stand up. I'm just a guy. I mean, you shouldn't be worshiping me. We know that the Lord is powerful. Matthew 10, 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are neither, not able to kill the soul. Rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul. And so you can understand. Jesus said, fear not. Don't be afraid of anything. When she was, I'm going to go back 20 or 30 years ago, Beth Ann was afraid to fly. Couldn't get on a plane. She'd have to be drugged. Sometimes she has to be, would have to be carried. Sometimes um, she would ha have to be just totally consoled in order to be able to get on an airplane. And now, God just took care of it. She asked the Lord to minister. She decided she's not going to be afraid. She walks into a plane. She lays her, as, just as she's walking in, you know, you step inside and you're at the edge of the plane. She just lays her hand up on that plane and says a, says a word and knows that that plane's going to its destination. If you want to be safe, be with her on a plane because she knows that she's going to be fine. That's a different thought. We have something to fear. The thing we should fear is the fact that God has the ability to destroy us or to save us. And praise God, he's decided to save us. Deuteronomy 31.8 and the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Jesus went before us. He tasted death first. He knows what it's like to pass from this world. He's the one who in the garden said, Father, let this cup pass from me. He's the one that had the nails driven into his hands. He's the one who suffered. 
He who knew no sin was blamed for everything, and he was allowed to die in our place. All that we are that's evil was laid on him. He knows what we're going through. I used to think that wouldn't be true. God couldn't possibly know what I'm going through. Jesus learned it right then. He knows what I'm going through. And praise God for that. And thus, therefore, since he's gone before us, he's with us. He'll never fail us. He'll never forsake you. You ever feel like God's left you? You ever feel like the Lord is just not being with you? You're mistaken. That poem about footprints, where it says, I was looking in the sand and I noticed now there's only one set of footprints. You're just not being with me. And God would be right there saying, no, that's where I was carrying you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He never turns away. It's, he, we're like children and we can hide right behind our mom's skirt. That would be like a Mother's Day thing. The Lord's like, like any kind of mother. He would be right there and we can grab on. We can grab on to dad's hand, our father's hand when things get tough. Next, 117b through 18a, Jesus said again, I am the first and the last. But he identifies what he's been saying. He said that several times. We talked about it a couple weeks ago and I think before that. I am the first of the last. I am he that was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. See, the Almighty, the only part of God that has ever been dead and has come back from the dead and be alive forevermore is the Lord Jesus. It's God's Son. That's the part of God that's been in between man and the Father always. That's the part of God that was here. That's Abraham's God, Isaac's God, Jacob's God. The one that they interacted with, that was Jesus. And even though at the baptism of Jesus, the Father up in the sky says, this is my son, the Holy Spirit falls in the form of a dove, and Jesus himself is standing in the water, that's at least three, a three in one. The Father's real, the Holy Spirit's real, the Spirit can dwell in us now that Jesus has died on the cross and has risen from the dead. If you have faith, the Holy Spirit can dwell in you because you've been made over. They're all real. Jesus is the one that is speaking, and he's the one that was dead and is now alive forevermore. In Revelation 1, 8, 10 verses ago, he said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come. That was in our first week of Bible study. Jesus is the one speaking. He is the Lord. Luke 7, 14 through 16, and he came and touched the bear, buyer. Have you ever heard that word? Most people have not. It's actually like a rack that they would put a body on or you could put a casket on that people would carry. When I have to do a funeral today, they set the casket onto a rolling buyer. They put it on that has wheels and they wheel it through until you reach the point where the pallbearers are going to lift it and walk it and put it into the hearse. So the rack that a body or a casket sits on is that word, bar. And so as you read that, no kidding, it is different. And they came and they touched, and he came and touched the buyer, the carrier. And they that bear him stood still. And he said to the person who had died, who was on that place, he said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. Now, we know that Jesus is the first person who came back from the dead. He came back from the dead having his human body die and came back into an eternal body. 
one that never gets sick, never grows old, doesn't die. It's called in the Bible a glorified body. When he rose from the dead, he was glorified. Others had risen from the dead. We say risen, it really means healed from the dead. Their bodies had died and their bodies were healed. Jesus, his body died and he was made over. Something that's going to happen for us in the future. He will come, we will be made over. If we've died, our bodies will be resurrected and we will be made over. If we're still alive, we'll be caught up together with him and we'll be made over into a new creature, into a new body, one that is like Christ, one that is glorified. He that was dead, he sat up and began to speak. And, he delivered un and they delivered him unto his mother, and there came a fear upon all. And they all glorified God and said that a great prophet is risen amongst us, that God had visited his people. They didn't know who Jesus was. Even today, there are groups of people who call themselves a church, who say Jesus was a great prophet, but not God in the flesh. There's a difference there. I teach and believe with all of my being that Jesus is God in the flesh. He was God in the flesh and he is God now. And even though I do believe in a Trinity, I'm what they call Trinitarian, God has more than one personality. And at the same point in time, Jesus being Lord is a separate personality. And so more than a great prophet, he was prophet. He died on the cross and came back from the dead and served as our high priest. And he's coming, he's going to return in the clouds. He's gonna start a kingdom here on earth and he will be the king. Prophet, priest, and king. Christ himself serves all of those positions. Right now, functioning as our high, our high priest, preparing to come as our king. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. You can't be a first fruits anticipating then that there wouldn't be a second fruits. Jesus was first. Then the Bible says he entered into heaven. He paid the payment to buy us back. He preached to the spirits who were in prison, having done that. And those who had died in Christ and those who had been faithful unto God, the Bible says that they were resurrected from the dead, that they walked around in the city with Jesus while he was here after his resurrection. People saw them. I don't know how you would feel if you saw all those people who had died before you resurrected from the dead. Would you be convinced that it's real? Would you be certain if you saw someone that you knew had died and now they were back? Jesus died, he was first. After him, those people who had been faithful unto God who were occupying the place, we call it hell, it's called Hades, but it's the Abraham's bosom side of Hades. It's the paradise side when Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. That emptied out. All of those people were resurrected. They walked amongst the people who were alive. We're gonna do that in the future. We're gonna be resurrected into that glorified body. Revelation 1, 18b. Amen. And if we back up, I am he that liveth, I am alive forevermore, 18b. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. I do take a lot of the Bible literally. I kind of doubt that the key to death is a physical key. I kind of doubt that the key to life is a physical key. I don't think hell has a door that has a physical key. Some people do. Maybe I'm wrong. I can't tell you for sure. I think the key to life is having Christ as your savior. The key to life is believing that he died on the cross for your sins, that he took your sins. Have you ever had anybody say, I'll tell you the key, 
it's not a physical key. It's not like one that you hold in your hand to open a door. It's a concept. I think Jesus is the key to life and he is the key to death. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, through his faithfulness unto God, through the fact that he is who he said he was, he is God in the flesh, he did pay the price to buy us back. He has the keys of hell and death. He even is the key to hell and death. He has power over life and death, and it all rests in faith. Matthew 16, 15 through 19. And Jesus said unto them, Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter. This is where Simon gets his name changed to Peter. Now understand that Peter is a piece of the rock. Names have meaning, and the name Peter is a piece of the rock. Then Jesus goes on and he says, and upon this rock, that's a different word. That's a word that means a mass of rock. And upon this rock will I build my church. Now I mention that because there are church denominations that teach that Peter is the rock and that it's upon him that the church is built. And they look upon him as being the rock and he's the leader of the church. And even though Peter is past now long, he's the leader of the church and he's the rock. But they're two different words. Peter means a piece of the rock. And the rock that Jesus spoke of here means the whole mass of rock. The fact that Jesus died on the cross and has risen from the dead, the fact that he is Lord, God in the flesh, all of that has to do with salvation. It's the only means by which we can be saved. It's the only means by which we can have eternal life. Peter's a part of that. He's a little piece of it. He's going to go forward and he's going to preach and he's going to teach and he's going to be part. So is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is a part of that big rock. But the real truth is the fact that Christ is Lord, that he paid the price for our sin and death, and that we have salvation through faith in him. And so... We go on, thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the, king, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Again, they're not physical keys, I don't think so. The key is you preach the gospel and tell people what Christ has done, they believe, and they get saved, and they escape hell, and they get heaven, and they have eternal life, that's the key. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you will bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Verse 19, chapter 1, book of the Revelation, first part. The Lord speaking to John says, I want you to write these things which you have seen. Now, this part of the verse is actually pretty important because He's giving to John an outline of what the whole rest of the book of the Revelation is going to be. He says, okay, John, write down these things. I want you to write down the things which you have seen. What you have seen. Now, what did he see? We've known it over the last couple of weeks. Write the things that you have seen. He saw candlesticks. I told you that those were lampstands. A candlestick itself does not have a light. It holds the light. And so he saw candlesticks. What else did John see? He saw the Lord. He called him the Son of Man. What did that mean? It meant a person. Jesus was a person. He used to be a person in a human body. Now he's a person in a glorified body. And what did he see? He saw Jesus' hair, he saw his eyes, he saw his feet, he heard his voice, he saw Jesus' hand holding seven stars, and he saw a sword coming out of his mouth, he saw that he was glowing, he saw Jesus as he is now. A similar thing that he had been seen by a couple of people who had passed on, Moses and Elias, when Jesus was in what's called the Transfiguration, 
when he was here in a human body walking around, he was glorified, he was transfigured in their sight. The inner part of who he was shone through the outer part. And so those are the things that they had seen. He saw and is going to see and write the things which are. That's talking about messages to the seven churches. You remember I said to you, at the time of this writing of the book of Revelation, there were seven major churches, each of which represented what I think is going to be a time period throughout the entire church. And those seven churches actually existed, and then they spiritually exist, being part of the entire church throughout all history. And so he saw those seven churches, and so he's going to write down the messages that he gives to the seven churches, which we don't have all of right now, and we're only going to see part of one today. And then he's also going to write down 19c, the things which shall be hereafter, because this book of the Revelation includes a prophecy for what's coming. So 19a, b, and c, verse 19, really all about an outline of the book of the Revelation. Verse 20, chapter 1. Also, I want you to understand, Jesus is saying, the mystery of the seven stars. So he's going to explain some things, some of the things that he has seen. Which thou sawest in my right hand, Jesus holding the seven stars. And he's going to explain, even now, the seven golden candlesticks. Jesus says, the seven stars are angels of the seven churches. Now, angel means messenger. A messenger can be a human being. A messenger can be a heavenly creature. Which is this? I have a tendency to think probably the angels of the seven churches were the seven leaders of the church. The seven people that God had chosen to be their pastors of each church. Those seven churches were along the west coast of Turkey, and John's writing from an island just off that coast. And so included in this is a message from God to each of those churches that existed at that time and to the entire church about what the history of the entire church is going to include. The seven stars are angels, probably pastor teachers, of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks, which you saw, are the seven churches. So now, he saw a vision, he saw candlesticks, he saw something holding the light. We're a church. We hold the light. The church is the people. It's not a physical building. The church is the people who make up a congregation. And each of you is holding a light. If you believe that Christ died on the cross and has risen from the dead, you have a light inside of you. You hold that light. You aren't the light. You hold the light. And the light shines forth. And it's your job to not hide that light under a bushel. These seven churches, they were those seven candlesticks. And the seven stars, they were the seven angels, probably pastors. Ephesians 4.1 says that God gave, the Lord gave, some apostles. You know who they are. We know Matthew, Mark, and, you know, we, we know the people who followed Jesus who were disciples. We know those people who became apostles, sent ones from God. He gave some apostles, he gave some prophets, he gave some evangelists, and he gave some pastors and teachers. It's a little bit different. The and there combines those two. They're teachers that pastor and pastors that teach. And so God provided all of these people for the existing church in order for it to grow. How can you hear without a preacher? Preachers speak it forth and you hear. Galatians 4.13 through 14 says, You know how through infirmity of the flesh, Paul says, I preach the gospel unto you as a pastor teacher. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, you despise not nor rejected. 
but you received me as an angel of God. There's a couple good things in there. Sometimes people don't look great. Some people don't dress well. Sometimes people have a different look to them. Sometimes people are from a different nationality. Some people, I can remember very clearly, I'm gonna say it was 30 years ago, when a young man walked in, had long hair, had tattoos all over him, and people were going, who is this? You know, and we just loved the heck out of him. I didn't care what he looked like. I've had people come into churches, they don't have any money, they're wearing old clothes, I don't care, and we shouldn't care either. None of those things are important. Paul's saying here, even though he had some infirmity in his flesh and he had some temptation in his flesh, he wasn't despised or rejected, and we don't despise anybody. We don't reject anybody. You receive me as an angel of God. Remember I said, I think those angels of the seven churches are the seven pastors that were in those seven churches. The seven leaders for each of this special period of time in the book of Revelation. The people who are followed, the people who are followed them. You can call that double fulfillment. It's fulfilled that those churches existed and that they had pastors and they're the seven stars and the seven candlesticks are those churches, but yet they also include all churches throughout all time. You receive me as an angel of God. Chapter 2. I guess I'll go on. Chapter 2, verse 1. This is the first message to the first of the seven churches. It's not even going to be the complete message. This is the positive part of his message. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. God's holding his leaders in his right hand. <coughs> he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of those seven golden candlesticks, the Lord is amidst the church. This is probably, if we want to take the church of Ephesus represents that church at that time, back when Jesus had just recently died on the cross within a hundred years or so. And it represents the whole church throughout history. This is probably the church in existence from 31 AD until maybe even up to 300. That first 100, 200, even 300 years. The book of Psalms 139, 9 through 10 says, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell uttermost in the parts of the sea, even there will thy hand lead me and thy right hand hold me. You have to understand, he's everywhere throughout the church. He's here now. He's with us. He's in you through the power of his spirit. You cannot escape Jesus. And in each of the messages to the seven churches, He's there with them, and he's giving them a review. He's saying to Paul, I want you to talk to that church over there in Ephesus, and I want you to tell them this thing. I'm going to lead out the things that I want you to tell them. And at the same point in time, he's speaking to all churches, and everything's cumulative. He's speaking to the church from the beginning to the end, and he says to them, chapter 2, verse 2, I know your works. I know your labor, and I know your patience. Uh, labor there sounds like works and labor are the same thing. Works is like the good and bad things you do, and labor there is the weakness, and patience usually involves endurance. So he's saying, I know all the stuff you do. You can't close the door. I see everything. I heard somebody even recently say it's kind of scary to know that God's watching me. You can't close the door. You can't hide. Everything that you do, God's watching. He sees it all. I know your works. I know the weaknesses that you have. I know how much you endure. I also know how, verse two, two, chapter 2, verse 2, you cannot bear them which are evil. Psalm 1, 6. 
The Lord knows the way of the righteousness, and the way of the ungodly shall perish. There's an action and there's a reaction. God knows everything. Things that you do that are wrong end up bringing bad to you. Things that you do that are great end up bringing good to you. And the ungodly people, the things that they do end up bringing them death. People who do not believe in Christ, I think, are included in that ungodly people statement. Second John, verse 10. If there comes unto you anyone that brings not this doctrine that you've received, let him not into your house. Don't big, bid him Godspeed. Um, there is evil in the world. You already know that. There are bad people in the world. You've experienced that. Have you ever said to someone who's not a believer? Have you ever said to someone who has no faith? Have you ever said to someone who could be very well wicked? Have a great day. It says right here in the Bible, we're not supposed to wish people. Godspeed means blessing, benefit, good stuff. The only good thing you can do for somebody who doesn't believe, for somebody who's down and out, you pray for them and you tell them about Christ. You tell them how Jesus has changed your life. That's important. And so, don't wish people Godspeed. There are people who are liars. There are people who are evil. Second Corinthians, let's see. Verse two, two B. Thou hast tried them who say they are apostles and are not. You have found them liars. There are fakes. There are people who come to church they don't really believe. They just come because they're coming with somebody or grandpa used to come or grandma used to come. They just go through the motions. They don't, they don't think Christ died on the cross and has risen from the dead. They've never prayed and asked him to come into their life. They're fakes. Then you got people who come to church who are only there to undermine things, hurt people, cause problems. That happened all the way back here at this time, fake Christians, people going through the motions. Then in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 14, there were false apostles, deceitful workers, who transformed themselves into the apostles of Christ, people who were teaching evil things, people who, even now you've got people who teach that this, this whole book is just a made up fantasy. When in reality, it's probably the most amazing book that has ever been assembled in the history of mankind, it will change your life. False apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles, and you have to understand that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan looks like he's good. No, we picture the devil as in a red suit carrying a pitchfork. He's really easy to understand. I mean, you can recognize him wherever you go. He's that guy wearing the red suit, carrying the pitchfork. You know, that's not how it looks. He'll look enticing. He'll look like, wow, that's wonderful, until he sucks you in and breaks you down. He's here in churches all over the world. He's not in, why would Satan want to go to the bar, get all drunk with people, encourage people to just fall all over themselves? Why would he want to go to every evil place that you can think of, why would Satan want to go there? Those people are already stumbling and falling. He's looking to come to the church. He's looking to come to the school. He's looking to come to places that he can hurt people and lead them astray. Revelation 2, verse 3. I recognize that you have borne and put up with. You've had patience. And for my name's sake, that's different. He added my name's sake. For my name's sake, you have labored, and you have not fainted. Fainted means you haven't quit. So Jesus repeats himself there, what he's already just said about how they had patience and they've labored. But this time he adds, labored for my name's sake, labored for the name of Jesus, and you have not quit. 2 Thessalonians 1.4 says, We ourselves are excited in glory in you. 
the Apostle Paul writing that he is really happy in the people of the, that he's writing this letter in 2 Thessalonians to. In the churches of God, for your patience, for your faith, in all the persecution and tribulation and all the things that you endure. Paul said he's excited about that. And John here in the book of the Revelation says that he's excited about that. Every one of us needs patience. Every one of us has to endure. We have to bear whatever the burden is that we've got. And we've got to not faint. We've got to not quit. Every single one of us has suffered some kind of persecution, gone through some kind of tribulation, had some kind of trouble. And here in this church, during the first few hundred years that the church even existed, 2,000 years ago almost, during those first few hundred years that existed, they had to have patience too, and they were suffering tribulation too, and they were being rejected too, and they needed to not give up. If they'd given up, we wouldn't have a church today. Don't faint. Don't give up. Not everything was right with the book of the Revelation in that church. The Lord had some things that weren't so good that he wanted to say. Tune in again next week, and I'll tell you what those things were. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, for your precious truth, for the grace that is ours, for all your mercy, all that you show us, especially for Jesus. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you're here today and you've never prayed and received Christ as Savior, won't you do that before you leave? You've heard the truth of how he died on the cross for your sins. Won't you pray? If you've received Christ as Savior, maybe you need to just let God know that you still believe. And you can just pray this prayer with me. I'll lead you in the words. Just say, Heavenly Father, think it in your heart and mind, or you can whisper it out loud. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I know he died on the cross for me. I believe he came back from the dead. I pray you'd come into my life. Forgive my sins. I receive Jesus as my Savior. And I give my life to you. And thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. So glad you came out this day. Tonight we're going to be outside for evening service. And so if you want to bring some place to sit or you can sit on one of the benches out there. Hope to see you then. Grace and peace. Be safe on the way out.